Hello, my name is Tony. Several commenters and subscribers have mentioned this nondescript little espionage thriller from 1987. I saw it back in the day, thought it's so-so, hadn't seen it since. So I managed to lay my hands on a nice crisp HD copy and took another look. Has it aged better than I expected or is it a terminally deteriorated relic? Let's have at it. Thriller writer Frederick Forsyth hit the big time with his first novel in 1971, The Day of the Jackal. It was a fictionalised account of an assassination attempt on the then French president Charles de Gaulle. Despite everyone knowing the ending, de Gaulle hadn't been assassinated at that point and never was, because it would have been a waste of a bullet. The book was a roaring best-selling success. It was a box office and critical hit as a movie starring Edward Fox in 1973. Three more of Forsyth's books were made into films. The Decifile in 1974, The Dogs of War in 1980, and The Fourth Protocol in 87. The Day of the Jackal was remade or reimagined, if you please, as a Bruce Willis Richard Gere crap fest in 1997. Original Jackal and the Decifile are the best screen iterations of his work. There's no doubt about that. The Dogs of War was a limp ass disappointment, and as for The Fourth Protocol, I'm gonna hack through it for ya right now. The Fourth Protocol takes its literary cues from Len Dayton, Graham Greene and John le Carre, attempting to absorb their focus on the intricacies and human failings of those enmeshed in the labyrinthine world of Cold War spycraft. The book is a far denser and more convoluted affair than the film, where the narrative is far more straightforward and direct. However, in his writing, Forsyth fails to match the cynical wit and style of Dayton, the crushing guilt and crisis of conscience beloved of Green, or the dazzling emotional and technical depth and detail of Le Carre. He's not quite in their league. So do the film. It starts with real-life British traitor and spy Kim Philby, Michael Bilton, turning up at a snowy military outpost for a top-secret meeting with KGB head General Gavorshkin, Alan North. Philby is greeted by a military minion who informs him that Gavorshkin has left and plans have changed. He then shoots Philby in the head. This didn't happen in real life. Philby, who defected to the Soviet Union in 1963, died in his home in Moscow in 1988 of congestive cardiac failure, probably resulting from his chronic alcoholism. Not many people this side of the Berlin Wall mourned his passing. Still, it's quite pleasing to see him get in a fictional face full of bullet hue, lousy treasonous twat that he was. Major Petrovsky, Piers Brosnan, is called to another snowy military installation to meet with Gavorshkin. He is given orders for an ultra-deep cover mission in the UK. Petrovsky is the poster boy for sneaky Soviet shenanigans and seems just the right type of monolithic, unquestionable questioning automaton for such a job. When he reads his mission brief, he finds he's been ordered to kill his military mission handler. He immediately slams a car boot lid down on him, applying pressure until his neck breaks. It doesn't seem strange to him that those connected with the mission are getting bumped off even before it's begun. Oh no, this boy is purely fire and forget material. Over in the UK, John Preston is breaking into a posh apartment on New Year's Eve. He's an MI5 officer played by Michael Caine, who blows a safe to expose the traitorous activities of a Secret Service official by revealing the incriminating evidence within. His boss, the acting director of MI5, Brian Harcourt Smith, Julian Glover, is pissed because the operation was unauthorised. He punishes Preston's insubordination by moving him to the airports and ports department. Happier chappy is Sir Nigel Irving, Ian Richardson, a high-ranking spook who turns Preston's findings to his advantage. Back in Rusky World, Gavorshkin's subordinate, Borisov, Ned Beatty confronts his old friend and KGB Mandarin General Karpov, Ray McNally, and questions the stripping of his Department of Resources and the poaching of his star KGB goon Petrovsky. Karpov is unaware of any of this, so investigates and finds that Gavorshkin has launched an unsanctioned mission to breach the Fourth Protocol. I'll explain. In 1968, there was an East-West agreement to limit the spread of nuclear weapons. It consisted of four protocols, the last of which forbids non-conventional delivery of a nuclear weapon to a target. Petrovsky has been charged with assembling a nuclear bomb and detonating it at a US air base in the UK, killing thousands into the bargain. Blame will fall on the Americans, strengthen the anti-nuclear movement in the UK and irreparably damage NATO relationships, thus paving the way for Soviet advancement in European territories. 
Now wait a cotton picking minute. This sounds a bit too familiar. I thought it at the time and I still think it now. And if you think it too, you may also connect that thought to the 1983 Roger Moore James Bond movie Octopussy. Oh yes, the plot of the fourth protocol is identical. In Octopussy, a gloriously overacting Stephen Burkov playing Russian General Orlov, whose plan was to detonate a nuclear bomb on a US air base in Europe, blame the Americans for the disaster, damage NATO, and promote the advancement of the Soviet Union into European territories. Surely, though only a mean-spirited cynic might suggest that Forsyth pilfered this plotline for his book? Have you met me before? Let me introduce myself. Tony Mean-Spirited Cynic at your service. Yeah, okay, it could have been a coincidence, but for my money, it's a fucking close-run thing. As Preston takes up his new position in airports and ports, a Soviet sailor disembarking in Glasgow is stopped leaving the dock by a guard. He makes a break for it straight into the path of a lorry and is instant roadkill. Searching his belongings, Preston finds a disc of polonium. The sole purpose of such an item is to act as a detonator for a nuclear device. Petrovsky has assumed the name James Edward Ross and has rented a house on an estate adjacent to a US airbase. Most of the houses on the estate are occupied by airbase personnel. Petrovsky zips around on a motorbike in black leather garb, picking up bomb components smuggled into the country by various agents. The death of Polonium Man means a replacement must be sourced. It's couriered in on a plane. Whilst Petrovsky waits at the airport for it to land, the only gay in arrivals gets a come-hither vibe from him, Christ knows why, and follows him for what he imagines will be a quick bend in the bogs. He sees something he shouldn't, Polonium Man 2 handing over a trans sister radio in which the disc is secreted. Petrovsky collars the guy and picks him up, with a promise of some illicit car sex. As the hapless Lothario moves in to administer a friendly blowjob, the Russian rascal slits his throat in what is the most vicious and savage scene of the movie. Cool. Preston suspects a nuclear bomb is being assembled on UK soil. He gives the report to Harcourt Smith, who dismisses it out of hand. Now, how likely is it that the acting director of MI5 would feel it completely unalarming that a Soviet sailor is found to be smuggling a disc of polonium into the country when the sole purpose of said item is to detonate a nuke? It's too heavy to use as a frisbee, a bit flat for an ashtray, and not decorative enough as a cake stand. Well, that's what we've got here. Confirmation of the myth that the intelligent bit of military intelligence is a super misnomer. It's a credibility stretch, though. Irvin, however, takes it seriously and backs Preston's hunch, providing him with the resources to investigate. Meanwhile, Petrovsky attracts the attention of two of his neighbours, Matt Max Headroom Frewer and Betsy Brantley, a US air officer and his promiscuous wife. They invite the Soviet to go bowling and boozing, being right neighbourly, y'all. And he goes along to strengthen his cover. As the husband gets pissed drunk, the wife comes on to our bomb-making Boris with all the sedan subtlety of Prince Andrew popping triple strength Viagra at a junior girls school party in Pizza Hut. She gets rejected by the icy Ivan and is left as deflated as a perished saucy Cindy sex doll. Hell hath no fury I'm thinking. Now I'm reading the signpost here guessing this couple or at least the winsome wife is going to interfere with Petrovsky's plan in some way or see something they shouldn't and come to a sticky end as a result. In fact I'm fired up for it. Looking forward to it. Nope, never happens. That's it. They serve no narrative purpose outside of being there to take Petrovsky out for the night and the wife to make some failed advances. After this, nothing else is seen or heard from them. What the hell? Joanna Cassidy arrives as Irina, a Russian nuclear bomb-making expert, and moves in with Petrovsky masquerading as his wife. Together in a tense, techy scene, they put the bomb components together in the kitchen. Irina sets the timer for two hours, which will give Petrovsky time to get clear. However, when his back is turned, she resets sets it to zero hours, which means when he primes it to blow, he's going to blow with it. Petrovsky's own coded mission orders from Kvoshkin, once deciphered, advise him to kill Irina. Preston and his team have been shadowing Winkler, a known Czech KGB agent who has landed in the country. He leads them to Petrovsky, who meets with him at a biker cafe to pick up another component for the bomb. They track Petrovsky to his estate. Following the assembly of the nuke, Irina and Petrovsky have sex. We get to see Irina's exposed right breast, which may or may not be significant. Petrovsky doesn't bother with a post-coital cigarette, just shoots the girl in the chest and puts her body in the bath, partially covered by a bedsheet. Her right breast is exposed. The director, John McKenzie, must have liked this image because we see it a lot. Arena dead in the bath, right breast exposed. What is this telling us? What is the director trying to say? Being Russian, shouldn't it be the left breast? Is it a coded message telling us Brosnan isn't the only right tit in this film? 
It was, is, and remains a complete mystery to me. If anyone has any idea, let me know. Preston and his team, along with a squad of SAS operatives, set up surveillance on Petrovsky's pad. Petrovsky makes to set the timer on the bomb, but senses he should check it first. The timer case is locked, so he retrieves the key from around Arena's neck, which gives us yet another look at her right breast, and finds the timer set to zero, at which point Preston and the SAS bust in. Preston and Petrovsky fight, with Preston neutralising him, and even though the Russian is no longer a threat, an SAS operative deliberately machine guns him to death. We needed to talk to him! Sorry, boss. Orders. The film ends at the funeral of the real DG of MI5, Sir Bernard Hemmings, Michael Goch, wherein Preston encounters Irvin and Karpov together. They've made a deal to keep the whole escapade quiet, Karpov having dispatched Winkler, a known red flag, to deliberately lead to Petrovsky. Preston tells them... It's about time they put you in a fucking museum. and storms off to spend some time with his young son. Implication being that he won't make a fuss or else the security services will lean on the kid, I imagine. The fourth protocol is a solid, non-flashy, straightforward spy caper. There are no bells and whistles, no pyrotechnical set pieces, and I suppose the term that sums it up best is old-fashioned. Michael Caine has played this role many times before, and here his insubordinate, smart Alec Harry Palmer persona is pressed back into service. He's older but not much wiser, and the requirements of the part don't stretch him in any way. It's Caine doing what he's done before, and doing it just as well, which is a good thing. Brosnan is a suitable fit as the softly spoken and chillingly lethal Petrovsky. It's a one-dimensional part played by a one-dimensional performer, so it works fine. Joanna Cassidy, who achieved cult status as the replicant Zora Salome in Blade Runner, is a rare beauty, and her right breast does some very fine acting. There's a certain pensive stillness about it, especially after a character lies dead in the bath. Director John McKenzie demonstrates little of the power and stylish dynamism he showcased in The Long Good Friday, his best and most successful work. This is pedestrian by those standards and doesn't illustrate any degree of real creative enthusiasm at play. The score by Lalo Schifrin is equally as perfunctory. But Phil Mayo's cinematography is as crisp and clear as you like. He would go on to lens Brosnan's debut Bond film Goldeneye and Craig's first Bond out in Casino Royale. There's nothing much in the fourth protocol to get anyone too excited. Kane's elaborate break-in and consequent exposure of a secret cell in civil servant and Petrovsky's relationship with the American couple are interesting distractions but don't contribute anything to the wider narrative, just background filler, taking up space and going nowhere. The SAS takedown climax is fine and moderately tense but nowhere near as pulsating and compulsive as the end game of Who Dares Wins and the blatant plot steal from Octopussy gives the impression of a film and novel that was struggling somewhat for inspiration. Of course, that issue lies squarely with Forsyth source material and not the movie itself. It's another one of those rainy Sunday afternoon films, undemanding entertainment and entirely comfortable in its banality. And a must for those of you who feel their lives are incomplete without experiencing Joanna Cassidy's naked right breast. I think I may be in that group. I feel better for it anyway. Thanks for any time or attention you've expended on this venture. I'm grateful for it. Do anything you want to do. Just don't sell secrets or build your own nuke in the kitchen. That's just plain wrong, pilgrims. Meanwhile, here's a song called Theme from Super Spy.
cold as a widow's bed Tales of a rare cryptography Lost in a dead man's head Smoke on the bridge at midnight Wait till the moon is full Keeping well out of the spotlight Triggers a bit to pull Lullabies from satellites on high All they hear before they die The theme from Super Spy Thank you. 